morning, guys. Good morning.
come while you come, and God is going to keep taking you. So just don't let don't let anything get in your way from repenting and trusting Jesus.
about some, Lord, bless the gifts that they give and let them do things that when we get to heaven that there will be there will be testimony told us of your money, the things that you gave, what you gave, how you poured out your life. It's made a difference. You didn't know it, but you were faithful. Thank you, Lord, that you can do so much with so little. We love you, Father. Yeah, man. Look, a yellow coat. How y'all doing? It's good when I hear the fellowship. Thank you, worship team. That was got me fired up. Thank you for that. Uh, but I feel like I spent all my energy singing just now, so I don't have much left. <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, a few announcements. We're going to get right into it. Uh, we need nursery workers. Uh, you've heard it said, all we need is love, but we also need nursery workers. Uh, so <laughs> we need some nursery workers. Uh, oh, Josh. Hmm. Why do you automatically discount yourself, Josh? You could be amazing. Uh, no, not just kids. We're talking babies. Babies. I held little Ezekiel uh, last week at my house, and that was the longest I'd ever held a baby in my life. It was a good solid three minutes. Uh, <laughs> it was terrifying. He was on the verge of crying the whole time. It was very stressful. So, but some of you are different. You have a calling for this, okay? And... Uh, Josh is a great flower girl. That's so true. Great flower girl. Paula? Testimony, here we go. No way, Jose. It's good prayer. 
So yeah, I, so anybody can do it. That's a powerful statement. And it was, we need, you know, it's just an opportunity to love, love kids, love, love babies. Uh, so it, it ideally, you know, uh, it, it's a ministry and it's a calling. Okay, and, be, and you value it because you know the Lord values it. So, but if, if you have any ideas who might be able to serve in that capacity, uh, Gabby's asked me to announce this the next few weeks, uh, and we'll just see what the Lord does. Uh, but please see me because uh, they just left China uh, yesterday for two weeks. So uh, you might be able to text her. I guess you could try that or, or let me know. That would I'd be most appreciated. We want our nursery to be able to continue. Uh, it's if someone has to serve in the nursery every week and they're missing uh, the corporate worship upstairs, that's, that to me is a heartbreaker. Uh, don't, don't want that. So if we all come together as a team, as a family, we can, we can make that happen. Uh, next thing I want to tell you about is our costume party happening tonight. Uh, all are invited. It's our annual GNL costume party. But do not show up without a costume. Okay? And show... <laughs> sounded really... Uh, dressing up as yourself is, doesn't count. What? Okay. Uh, I'm really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So true. Uh, try to do something, okay? I always tell the young people, you know, you, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. You, you, how many costumes can you come up with just using a cardboard box, okay? A roll of toilet paper has many ideas. Uh, that's happening tonight, 6 o'clock, and uh, please come and enjoy the chaos. It, it, it'll be great. Uh, also, see, get to meet some of the young people. Uh, that you may have never encountered before. So that is happening tonight. So uh, in, in line with that, uh, after our corporate worship this morning, uh, if you could help, uh, we're going to move all these chairs uh, out of the way and stack them up, and we'll leave uh, rows of chairs along the side for we'll places to sit, and then the rest of them will get stacked in a corner. Thank you, Toe. All right, and I, I was at another church last week, and uh, I sat on their chairs, very similar, but I just wanted to say ours have more padding, and I really appreciated that. So all those who helped out with the chairs, I want to say thank you once again. Okay, I love our padding. <laughs> uh, how many of you got to hear go to the wedding last week and hear Victoria sing? That, that was beautiful. Uh, and then she went freestyle a little bit, right? And uh, it was like a prayer song combo. Uh, so if you see Victoria, I don't see her right now, but uh, I want you to encourage her. If you're there at the wedding especially to, to use her gifts here. Okay, so that's our mission. We're going to, uh, I, I love this quote that uh, Angela gave our family, attack her with grace. Okay, I love that. <laughs> I use that, by the way, a lot. <laughs> uh, so our Friendsgiving is coming up November 20th. I want you to be thinking about who you can invite. We're going to have a great meal together in here. That's a ways off, so November 20th, Friendsgiving. Uh, we're going to have a, uh, a meal here. And just be thinking of people you can invite, because we all have some friends, right? One or two? A couple people, <laughs> right? Uh, next thing, uh, Pam Kucher is currently staying with, some of you know, uh, Nancy Bonjour, just down the street, a few blocks on the other side of the street on 12 Mile. She has her own room there, and there's a sofa there. She would like visits. She would like some visits. So it doesn't have, you don't have to take a lot of time. Uh, just text her first. Uh, and I heard that you might be the point person on that, Amber. Is that true, or is that news to you? Okay. And if you don't hear back from Pam, uh, just reach out to, to Amber Roberts. But we, we want to make sure she knows she's loved in this time. Uh, had a great visit with her, with Jeff. And she, when we entered the room, she was just, like, lit up. Like, oh, you're here. And it was like she had just won the lottery. So I uh, appreciate all of you reaching out to Pam. Uh, she's been a huge part of our church uh, for all these years, serving so faithfully, so committed in the background. And uh, we just want to, now's our time to show her some love, right? Amen. Okay. Uh, by the way, I haven't even mentioned this. Uh, I just alluded to it, and now I have the freedom. Uh, she's given me permission to share this. Pam Kucher, if you don't know, uh, has cancer all throughout her body. And uh, there is one potential, the doctors say there's one uh, potential Therapy, it's called immunotherapy. Uh, they and some things in, in line, like particular the strength in her body for her to even be able to attempt this immunotherapy. They're saying that that's the only thing uh, that the doctors know of that could save her. Uh, so we don't know how much longer 
any of us are going to be here, but with Pam, we, you know, she has this news. She's taken it very well, um, and I'm really hoping that she's going to be able to come here, get enough strength to come here, just sit on the stage and give us a testimony uh, of the things the Lord has taught her throughout her life. Uh, she was sharing some things that are just really meaningful for, for me in my life. Um, so just be praying for Pam. Uh, to that end, if you can just give her some cheer by giving her a visit, that would be wonderful, most appreciated. Okay. Uh, if you don't know where Nancy Bonjour is, uh, Amber can tell you. Uh, I can tell you. Uh, literally just a few blocks that way. The only house that's 12 miles is the ramp. Yeah, exactly. Other side of the street, there's a, there's a ramp going up just, just that way. You'll see it. It's like a yellowish orange house color by State Farm yeah right next okay so uh, my mind has been racing all morning just with this message and uh, I feel like the message was going one direction this whole week and then it took a left turn last minute and uh, I'm really just I want to pray father if you just help me to communicate what you you've been sharing with me this week even this morning or help me to just to be able to to communicate it in a way that's helpful for these people here gathered. Lord, I just want to ask and invite your Holy Spirit to help us. Lord, just uh, to apply these truths to our life specifically. Lord, that your people would be strengthened. They would be uh, helped. Uh, they would be comforted. <clears throat> they would be challenged. And Lord, this is for our good, for your glory. We pray this this morning. Amen. In Jesus' name. Where to begin? Okay, so just real quick, okay, because my goal in this series, like, you know, I think I've got a hold on uh, Revelation, and then I, I spend more time in study, and I'm like, and I'm thinking in my flesh, like, John, could you have been any more mysterious in this book? I mean, were you just trying to confuse me? Because I feel like I'm either going to spend the rest of my life studying this book, or I'm going to get to the point where it's, okay, that's all I can know, because everything else is mysterious. It's, but nevertheless, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Okay, and I, what I'm also simultaneously convinced of is that this this work that John wrote was actually it's, it's divine. It was written through the power of the Holy Spirit. It is it's, it's who who what mortal man uh, would be even able to write a book like this? It's amazing. So I, I want to encourage you to spend some time reading the Word, reading the Book of Revelation, get into the book because there's so many things that you're not going to be able to get until you get familiar with the book. All these things, you're not going to be able to see the patterns where he's going. If you just do a, a, a shallow uh, surface reading, it's like it, it, you're just going to walk away maybe confused, but there's so much there, and you can't really see it until you really get familiar with its structure. So to that end, I just want to encourage you, <clears throat> if there's one book you can read on the book of Revelation, you know what book it is? The book of Revelation. Okay? <laughs> Uh, don't ever doubt that. That's critical. <clears throat> I shared this book with you. This is actually going in the church library. This is called Revelation, a Shorter Commentary by G.K. Beale. G.K. Beale is currently a, a professor at uh, Wheaton Seminary. Uh, really appreciate him. But this, uh, one of his PhD students uh, helped him write this. That's why it says with David Campbell. Um, to take this work, I think it came out in 1998, I want to say. Uh, and they, they shortened this to come up with this, okay? So you, can you see the value? So <clears throat> this book, small print. This book, tons of footnotes on every page. This has a, a, been a great traveling companion for me because, you know, it, you, you, it's just, I only have to bring one book if I'm going to bring a book, right? It's heavy, but I don't ever have to wish that I brought another one because there's plenty there. So you can see the value. This is a lot going on. It's just all summarized in this. Okay? So that, that's why I think that's helpful. That's why I'm taking the time to show that to you uh, this morning. And, you know, as I've gone through both of these, you're not going to miss out a, on a lot by reading the shorter one. Okay? All the main points that we really need. The other part of it is just, you know, Beale, uh, you know, giving us... Uh, dipping into the academic scholarly world and defending his position against other authors from the past in order to give credibility to his thesis. Okay, so I, where to begin? I, 
I, my goal and desire is to keep our, our series in Revelation practical. But it's like we have to set the table with, with, some, with some concepts. I want to spend the next few weeks doing that. And my, my goal and desire this morning was to, to ask you a fundamental question because that's, that's going to help us determine what Revelation is actually doing. And I think I'm going to reserve that partially at least for community groups this week. Uh, I may get to it this morning, may not. But I, I want to ask you, um, you, you know, you got all these visions happening throughout the book of Revelation. What is their relationship to each other? And there's two fundamental options, okay? One is that they are chronologically or linearly uh, laid out. That is to say, it's a time sequence. That would be what we call the futurist position. At least that's what Beale calls it, many others too. Uh, that has been uh, what dispensationalists hold to. This, that is to say there is a sequence, uh, one event, one vision, because John keeps saying, after these things I saw, and then after this, and after this, and after this. And so they take that to say, well, the, the first vision happens, and then in time, next historically, well, in the future, what will happen in history will be the next vision that he sees. But the people that take a different position would say, actually, what's, it's not in a, a chronological sequence. It's actually this, this, when John says, after these things or next I saw, he's, he's, not, uh, he's telling us what order he received the visions in. That is to say, he receives one vision, but then maybe the next vision goes back in time to show us something that happened before that vision or at the same time of that vision. Okay? So the first option is what we call the futurist position, where everything in the book of Revelation, <coughs> beginning particularly chapter 4, verse 1, uh, moving forward to the end of the book, is, is chronological. The other position I want to mention just briefly is what we call, and I'm going to give you a new vocabulary word, don't be scared. Ready? Recapitulation. The re recapitulation view. All that means is something said, and then it's said again in a different way. Recapitulation, right? Is where he's saying one thing, he's describing one series of events, and then he says the same thing. He talks about the same series of events, maybe from a different angle, or he, he's zooming in or zooming out, but it's the same series of events again and again and again. So I would ask you, what, what's actually happening? My goal and desire ha was is to, uh, to read through some passages to let you answer that question yourself. And you say, well, why does it matter? Well, because we, we want to understand what the book means. And I'm going to stop there, probably. Uh, one of the problems we, we ha would have is, for instance, if you take it strictly linearly, uh, then Revelation 6 verse 12 says, for instance, that the sun became as dark as black cloth and the moon became as red as blood. Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from a tree. So the idea of the, the, the light that the sun and the moon are giving off the stars, black cloth, no light. But then if you take it literally, you skip forward to uh, two chapters, Revelation 8, 12, and it says, Then the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and the one-third of the sun was struck, and one-third of the moon, and one-third of the stars, and they became dark. So which is it? If it's linear, then if, if the moon becomes dark, black then how is it still shining two chapters later like how does that work out together you're like okay more confusion um, or is that the same event being described a different way okay so uh, let me possibly come back to that and let me let me back up and I want to get real practical with you some of you have would you confess you don't have to raise your hand would some of you confess that you think that theology is unnecessary or boring or dry, right? And you see a book this thick, you're like, oh my goodness, paperweight. <laughs> like, why? I just want to feel it, right? And you're more inclined maybe to the emotional aspect. Like we just, it got, I felt emotion when I was singing those songs just a moment ago, right? And we need that too. But so what I want to do right now is, and I'll try to do this in as short a period of time as possible, and Ben, can we get that clock going? Because I'm going to need that. Um, 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Five minutes. Okay, four. Uh, right? You imagine having a person in the congregation who did that? Like, okay, you got five minutes. Five. Okay. Four. Okay. One minute. All right? Just all on their own. I, I, I've decided that your sermon needs to be over right now. Um, <laughs> I could say more, but... <clears throat> I want to convince you that the, the book of Revelation, reading it, should fundamentally change your whole outlook on life in a positive way. Because I, I, I believe we live in two brain states very often, either one in, in like creativity, uh, in, in strength, in productivity, uh, where we are engaging the world, we're tackling the world, we're going on the offense, and then the other brain state we, we live in is in fear. We're afraid. We're scared, right? And it's a reactionary uh, stance to what's happening. We feel overwhelmed or it's out of control. Can the Revel book of Revelation affect the way that you engage with the world? Yes. She was here for a minute. And... <laughs> Thank you for that hope. I need that. Uh, that's good. Uh, can the book of Revelation fundamentally affect the way you engage with the world? Or is it just like a book that's like esoteric, like I don't know what it means, so it just sticks on my shelf collecting dust? I want to show you and, and convince you that it can change you. That's what I want to do. Because so that when you get into the book of Revelation, you can a actually get what it's trying to give. <clears throat> now, let, let me tell you how you... I'm, I'm going to get practical with you, and then I'm, I'm going to come back to Revelation. Can you, can you bear with me? Here, here's how we, how we navigate through life, Okay. We have beliefs, okay? I'm going to give you a sequence, okay? We have beliefs. From these beliefs, we have our thoughts. From our thoughts, based on what we're thinking, it leads to the emotions we have about a certain thing, right? Those, those emotions can then lead to your actions, so if you feel good about something, right, your action might be you're having a good feeling about it. You, you engage that thing. Versus if you have a negative feeling about something, you might run from that thing. Can you see the, 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 the connection between your emotion and your action? What was the, what was the first part of that sequence? Beliefs. Your beliefs fundamentally will lead to your actions. I mean, we can say all day long, whatever, right? But it's our actions. I'm telling Martez all the time, actions speak louder than words. We can assent to what we know to be true and should be true, but how we live will tell us what's, what we really believe. But because the beliefs are on the front end of that sequence leading to your actions, leading to ultimately how you will have lived your life when you stand before the Lord and give an account, can you see why the Bible is giving us, telling us truth? So it can shape our beliefs. Now, you can have an experience. Two people can have the same experience and assign different meanings to that experience. It may be true that some of us are sitting here this morning having had an experience where we assign a very negative meaning to that experience. And the result of that is the emotions we have, we feel defeated or depressed or, or life is losing its meaning. We're without hope. And in doing that, we, that, that, that belief that that experience we had, maybe it was a traumatizing experience. Maybe you experienced this, uh, betrayal. Uh, maybe you have a diagnosis that's going to shape your life. Whatever it might be, all of us have trials in this life, Correct. What if it's possible that you, what you're believing, the meaning that you're assigning to that experience is untrue? That, that belief that you're assigning to that experience it would be a limiting belief. So what happens is when you read the scripture and you, it's just like, okay, I need, I'm getting recalibrated with ultimate reality. So I'm stepping out of my microcosm into something external to myself. And I, I really fundamentally believe that that is, is, is essential, so important for us as humans. For me, it's not good enough for me to, to make up this fantasy about the world 
and say, if I believe it, that's enough. Yeah. That's true for me. Therefore, it's, it's, it's true enough. I, for me personally, I have to, I want to be connected with truth. With, uh, and I want to know the reality of that which is external to myself. Amen. And I want to align myself with that. Because I feel like otherwise I'm living in this fantasy that I've created. And it, oh, there will come a time in my, in my living where I will find, I will be confronted very, uh, I'll, I'll be confronted with the, the fact that it's, I've been living in a fantasy. It's not true. So I want to organize my life with, in line with ultimate reality. And that is what the scripture has given us. It's telling us this is ultimate reality. We submit to, to that reality instead of forcing reality to submit to our internalized fantasy. Amen. You see how that works? But it, often the case is we, we do the opposite. So if we have limiting beliefs, we need to be able to see those limiting beliefs as for what they are, untrue. Do you see how... The Bible, it, it, it's meant to shine, like illuminate our understanding to ultimate reality, including the reality that we're experiencing so we can walk in truth. That's what the book of Revelation is doing for us. If you think your life, and maybe, maybe it's just like I'm, I have a negative experience after a negative experience, and, you, and you, our tendency is to live as if the negativity that we experience is all there is. Can I tell you that Revelation is reminding us in a very big, very powerful way that this, our, uh, what we're experiencing is not all there is. Amen. In fact, there's that ultimate reality, which is a blessed hope, we are intimately connected with because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. So, did you know that your brain can reorganize? When you discover, when you can see a limiting belief is untrue, you, your brain can reorganize such that, hear this, that you can reinterpret the meaning of your past or present experience. And that's what, it, that's what Revelation can do for us. We can, it allows us to reassign the meanings of our experiences. And I, I'm just using that language because for me that really speaks to me because it, it has enough specific, uh, specificity where I, it, I can get my head wrapped around it. We can reassign the meanings of our experiences. So we have experiences like where we say things like, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, it's not my fault, they made me angry, it's their fault, I'm so bitter, they hurt me, so I'm damaged, I'll never get over it, you're not listening, I just feel beat up. Here's what the gospel does. The gospel gives us a fundamental reorientation to the experiences of our life. The gospel gives us a fundamental reorientation to the experiences of our life, such that we're able to extract ultimate meaning, true meaning. The fact we even, it gives us meaning because outside of this, I would argue that life, the things that we have, they don't have any ultimate meaning other than the meaning that we give them. But again, I said that the meaning that I assign to something, it needs to be connected with ultimate reality so that I'm not walking in a fantasy. Because like I said, one day you'll find the fantasy to, to be just what it is, and that is limited. So the gospel gives us a fundamental reorientation to the experiences of our life. That's, so if, if the gospel changes my belief, like, okay, I don't live in just a, a, a material universe, it, there's actually a spiritual element to, to creation. In fact, there is such thing as a creation. It didn't happen just spontaneously on its own. In fact, there's a creator who's spoken into existence and that he is a loving creator who actually cares deeply and intimately about me. He has a blessed future set for me. He's adopted me, accepted me into his family. Like with all that the word family means, he loves me. He gave his life for me so that I can be in relationship with him and that my hope, my future can be secure. That is a fundamental reorientation, is it not? So if that's a different belief, it's going to lead to how I think about things. And as I experience negativity in my life, I'm going to reconnect that negativity back to what I believe. 
And that's going to lead me to have different emotions about that negativity I'm experience, experiencing, leading me to have different actions. Let me give you an example from the Bible going back to Genesis in the, in the life of Joseph. What, did, what happened to Joseph? Any trauma? Did, did, was Joseph stuck in therapy? Like after the betrayal of his, uh, you know, and therapy is good. You know what word therapy means? In Greek, it means healing. That's good. But it's like, was he so beat up where he's living a life of bitterness? I mean, his own brothers, his own brothers. I mean, I've experienced betrayal, but no one's ever sold me into slavery against my will. Like uh, human trafficked. I've never been human trafficked, right? Like that's what happened to Joseph. And then on top of that, he gets, uh, he's doing really well serving his uh, master Potiphar and he gets falsely accused and thrown into prison and things are all, it's just going bad, 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 bad. But at the end, at the end of the story, what are we, what is, how does, what meaning does Joseph assign to all that negativity? Nailed it. So he is second in charge of all the land. Yeah, that's your rule. Yes. <laughs> he's a second in charge he actually, and his brothers are coming to Egypt for food they don't recognize him he could have thought to himself this is finally my chance to get revenge right. Amen. but what, it, what is the meaning that Joseph has assigned to those, those all those from his own family his own brothers Genesis 50 verse 20 you intended to harm me brothers but God intended it all for good yeah. <laughs> He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Do you see what Joseph's doing? He's able to transcend the negative experiences he's had to assign the meaning that I can see God's working through all of this. And look at the good that it has led to. This makes me ask a question. In, uh, I, I've heard this before uh, where someone says, um, how can the worst thing that ever happened to you turn into one of the best things that ever happened to you? Now, that is not to say that the betrayal that Joseph experienced was a great thing. It was still hurt, right? It, it was still wrong, still evil. But yet the, the end result, the, there was purpose behind it. Like, you can see, you know, in spite of the negative, it was negative. It was evil that I experienced, but that wasn't the end of the story. How can, like, in my life, you know, me... Uh, in rebellion against God for seven years, like experiencing all that negativity, I'm able to actually experience healing from all that stuff because I can see how God was allowing me to experience all those things so that now I'm able to help other, other people in, in, who are about to be in similar situations. Right. Like I, I, all those negative things, God turns them into lessons so that the cursing turns into a blessing. Yeah. And so I can say, wow, Timothy, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And so that allows me to get freedom. That allows me to get, get healing, to, to step out of something that could have just led to, my, to bitterness. In Genesis 45, verse 5, Joseph again, don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me, selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. Two verses later, God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. Isn't that what we want in our own life? So you think about it. If I take Joseph as the model, you look at those, those negative things in your life, how could I reassign the meaning through the power of the transformative power of the gospel, look back at those things and say, that person or that circumstance was meant for evil, but how can God now have meant it for good? How can I get victory over those things so that it leads to not only my life being blessed, but the lives of others around me being blessed as a result of that negative traumatic experience, whatever it might have been? Now, coming back to Revelation just briefly, John's already doing this. Revelation 1 9. I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering, partner in suffering, and in God's kingdom. Okay, so he's talking about his identity. I'm a partner in the suffering and in God's kingdom. I'm a citizen of the kingdom. That's who I am fundamentally. And in, guess here it is, patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos 
for preaching the word of God and my testimony about Jesus. So he, what meaning, so, so John is serving the Lord. He's preaching the gospel. The end result of that at this point is he's been sent off to an island so he can't bother anybody, so he can't influence people with his different countercultural values, his gospel value system. He's like, okay, send this person away. He could say, wow, I'm totally isolated. I was doing the right thing, and as a result, all this evil happened to me. I was serving God, and as a result, these bad things happened. Which leads to this question, like, when, when the bad thing happens, how do you have patient endurance? Because John is just saying, you know, in other places in the book of Revelation, we're just told, have patient endurance. But does that just come naturally? So how do you get it? And that's why I go back to that sequence of events. Your beliefs have to change. Because if your beliefs change, it leads to, if you have the right beliefs, it's going to lead of necessity to patient endurance. Of necessity, I say. So I was serving God, and as a result, all these bad things happened to me. Or I was serving God so much that the forces of darkness saw me as a threat. I was exiled, but my victory is sure, my hope secure, my future glorious. I will continue to remain faithful even in this trial so that when I see him, that's Jesus, he will call me as his own. Yeah, I can have patient endurance because my exile right now is not the end of the matter. And I can actually... uh, find praise, like find value in the fact that I was serving the Lord, and I am now having the opportunity to exercise patient endurance, and when he f- call, finds me, he's going to call me as his own, as Revelation 3 mentions, which I love that verse so much. See, here's where we, we remind us, uh, we're often re- trying to remind you that we can get bitter or get better in life, right? It's often that choice. And that's what I'm saying, like the, 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 the beliefs have to change about what you've experienced as leading to your bitterness. You've got to go back and reorient. Like you find that limiting belief that's causing you to see that completely as negative, where it's, where it's, it's limiting, where, where it's a defeat, leading to depression, leading to retreat in life. Change that and get a different outcome. You know, we talk about... And here, here's, I'm, I'm trying to get to the place where I can challenge you this morning. Because what I'm talking about, I've just mentioned, what I've been talking about, it, it's not optional for the Christian. Sometimes we act like what I've just been talking about are allowing the gospel to transform us. It's on our time when we decide. I know what the Lord is calling me to do. I know what I need to do. I need to get healing. He's bringing up these areas. It's on my time sequence. You know what that fundamentally assumes? That the Holy Spirit will just be there waiting for us whenever we decide. Does the scripture teach that? The Holy Spirit is super patient with us. Praise God. But I want to, I want to, that's not the whole of the matter. I want to challenge you this morning. So I want to give you some verses, but I want to go back to a concept and just set the table with this, just a meaning, because this is how God has created us. And as a result of the fall, Adam and Eve, sin came into the world, death by sin. So death passed upon all men, so that all have sinned. We're living under this curse. We have this fallen human nature, Galatians 5 example. Do you remember that soul-mind dichotomy I talked about a few weeks ago? A few times? That soul-mind dichotomy? Whereas uh, we have this internalized struggle where we are internally conflicted. That is to say, we have two things that we want that are in opposition to, e- to each other. That is to say, they're antithetical to each other. You can't have both. It's an either or. Right. You, you can't say, I want my business pattern that I'm addicted to. I like it. It makes me feel good. And say, I want healing. I want to get better. I want to be able to forgive the person that hurt me and let go of my bitterness. Do you see how you can't fundamentally hold on both of those things? Bitter, to be bitter is better, right? We try to reconcile those things, and that's where we get into the idea of cognitive dissonance, these, these, these tricks that our mind plays on us. But let me just run you through some of these dichotomies from between the soul and the mind, and then get back to Revelation again. The mind wants to self-justify, the soul wants forgiveness. 
The soul wants change. The mind is afraid of change. They say it's our greatest fear. It's public speaking, fear of change. And so when, when I notice these dichotomies in my life, I, try, I, I keep a list on a note doc, pad document on my phone. Like, oh, that's another dichotomy. And I, I want to keep an ongoing list. So I had three things before. I'm, I'm, I have a few more now. The mind wants to isolate. The soul wants connection. You, you, you've seen that battle in your own life, right? You've you got to recognize when you're, you're tempted to isolation because what, that your mind will give you all kinds of good reasons why that's a great idea. That'll really help you to isolate. You'll feel so much better in isolation away from your community. Meanwhile, the soul wants connection with others because we're made in the image and likeness of God, and we have to be because God is made in Trinity. God exists in Trinity, rather, not made. So, but the mind wants the bitterness, but the soul wants to cry. And I was just realizing, just, just meditating, pondering on this, this concept just like last week, and I'm, I'm wondering if it's true, I think it's true, that you know how those, you have those moments where you break down you're actually able to cry? Or is that just <laughs> me? Uh, it hasn't happened in a while, the crying thing. Um, one of the times I cried the most was at my grandma's funeral, and I thought before ahead of time, you know, I was supposed to help in the funeral speak, and I couldn't speak. I was uh, a blubbering idiot, as it were. Like, <laughs> I mean, I was torn up, right? But my soul, I think those, those crying moments are where the soul is getting healing. Yes. Now, there, there are other cries you can have, cries of bitterness, cries of great loss. But it's like this, the crying part, I think it's a way that our God has designed us to be able to go through a grieving cycle. You know what people like to say? They like to say, stop crying knock it off I mean yeah. the, uh, the, the guardian ad litem uh, was in our living room and she was telling my, my wife this last week to not express any hurt or, or uh, grieving uh, in front of Martez uh, Martez we got Rebecca you know Rebecca, we spent over a year and a half with Martez Rebecca is, is like super nurturing person if you knew Rebecca's mom you'd understand why uh, I always call Rebecca's mom the genius mom. She's the mom of moms because all moms call her to find out what moms do. And it's amazing to watch. It's just this gift. She's in charge of her whole nursery at our church. It's just how... It, and Rebecca's got some of this blessing. And so the result is she has this connection. Well, Martez is going home. And so we want that for him. We, that's been the goal the whole time. But nevertheless, there's going to be a feeling of loss, right? Uh, but the, the guardian of Leiden was telling my wife, don't cry. Don't express that, that emotion in front of Martez either. But like, that's the soul healing. Yeah. And like, we try to shut it down. And I think that's all why a lot of us, me especially, uh, when we first came to the Lord, there was crying involved. Because it was a fundamental reorientation. The gospel is transforming us, and we are seeing reality for the first time. And our soul, as a result, yeah, it was, was experiencing some healing even in that moment. And the result is our soul, soul cried out. Yeah. And so we shouldn't just shut those things down because our, our you know, the, the mind wants to, it's okay, you know, stiff upper lip. But the soul needs to go through that grieving process because you know what happens if you don't go through that grieving process? You get stuck in that loop. And what is, what is left in the loop? It's the bitterness. So it's, it's way better to express the emotion, express the pain, express the hurt, express the sorrow, give the cry, because guess what? I had a good cry. I had a good cry, and now I can move on. Like, I got closure on that. I'm not locked in a, in a, in a, a repeating loop. I got closure on it, and I, I feel like I got a cleansing. And now I'm ready to face the world because God's got my back. So the mind wants to isolate, the soul wants connection, the mind wants bitterness, the soul wants to cry, the mind wants the pain, but the soul wants to heal. So why am I taking the time to bring this up right now? Especially in a, in a, a sermon that's supposed to be out, the book of Revelation. This is, the, everything I've just been mentioning is what the book of Revelation can help you do. As far as to, to leave the... the, the the self-justification, to, to leave the isolation, to leave the bitterness, to leave the pain behind because the fun, revelation can fundamentally change your belief system about the external world, about reality. 
and that you can live in light of that so that you, like Joseph, can reorient your belief around God's reality, the truth, and get a different meaning from whatever negative thing you've experienced. Isn't that victory? Yeah. Isn't that what we want? But here's what we do. We say, no, I don't want it. I'm going to put it off till tomorrow. I can't deal with it. And here's what I think. You know, it's like the soul wants this growth. The soul wants change. The mind is terrified of change. But the mind, but what the Holy Spirit does is he nudges us. Do you ever get a nudging of the Holy Spirit and you resist? You know, and I, I feel like the Holy Spirit and Jesus, they have this toolbox, right? And in this toolbox, they have certain tools, okay? And I, you know, and if we resist, he's like, okay, I'm going to go to my toolbox because I have certain things I like to do. And, okay, so I'm nudging you gently. I, you know, I'm bringing people into your life to speak truth into your life. You're not wanting to hear it. What is one of the tools? Maybe this is just me. What? What is one of the tools that the Holy Spirit might grab out of his toolbox to implement into our life for, for a good purpose? Because we don't want it, we resist. And we, we resist his nudging. Like, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I'm scared. I'm scared. Pain, tragedy, hardship, challenging situation, right? And we think, oh, this negative stuff's happening. Is it? But I don't want to be stuck there. I don't want to just be stuck as this negative person that sees this, all these bad. I, don't, I want to be able to transcend that. I don't want to be a victim of my circumstances. That's not freedom. That's bondage. So he's like, you know what? You resisted, but I love you so much. I'm going to bring you to the place where you have to change. I'm going to bring you to the place where you're, you, you're, going, to, you're going to need me. You're going to be de see your dependency, because we're always dependent, but we like to tell ourselves different. right? Maybe that's another soul, mind-soul dichotomy right there. Mind thinks it's completely dependent and the soul knows it's dependent uh independent you know what i'm saying and I, i'm i'm like to the point in my life now where like you know what hurry up timothy and learn the lesson because god is so patient he'll leave me there until i learn the lesson it's like hurry up and learn it so we can get to the next one because he's got such a good memory in fact, God doesn't have a memory because all things exist simultaneously before him, right? Past, present, future. He exists outside of time. So yeah, he's going to leave me there. He's not going to forget. So I want to hurry up and learn that lesson. But I, I'm just saying that it also, and here's what I want to get into the challenging part, that uh, we have a tendency to think, when the Holy Spirit's been whispering, and we have a tendency to think that it's optional. But yet we sing the songs where he says, he's king of kings and lord of lords. He's our master. We bow and submit before him. Not in this area. Oh, no. I'm sovereign in that area. Oh, Lord. Off limits. Do you not see that do not cross sign? Like, no entry? Like, like, like back up. Holy Spirit, back up. And he's like, you forgot that I'm king of kings, lord of lords. Amen. Right? That's why it's, it's, you know, and by the way, when we're singing these worship songs, do you know that it's helping our minds recalibrate? Isn't that a wonderful thing? Yes. I was like, oh, yeah, that's true. Why am I? Yeah. Thanks, worship team. So good. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that first song, we're just proclaiming, right? Oh. And then I see other people proclaiming. I'm like, yeah, that's my brother. Oh, yeah, that's my sister. Yes. <laughs> Family. But Jesus says stuff like this. And here's where I want to get to a challenging part. Because, and I'm not trying to force you against your will to do the right thing to experience and growth, okay? Because the Holy Spirit is very patient and kind, all those fruits of the Spirit, yeah, He is those things, okay? But Jesus says things like this, Luke 9.52, anyone who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Like, okay, I experienced some pain, some suffering, like, he, he, God brought me to the place where I know I want the change, I need the change, okay, and then I even experiencing, I'm experiencing growth, I'm getting maturity in my life as a result of this, right? But guess then what we want to do? We get a little bit of relief, and what do we want to do? Look back. Look back. As soon as we get a little bit of relief, it's like, you know what? I, I don't need to really go through with it. Before we thought we have to go through it. It's either do or die because I can't live this way. We get a little bit of relief, and then we're like, our temptation is, is to put our, we put our hand to the plow and we're looking back. Like, you know what? Maybe I, I don't want to be so... Uh, 
extreme, right? Now, I was being so dramatic before. Like, it's not that big a deal. I can just get back into a coasting mode. Like, plateau is fine. Like, do we always have to be growing? Like, is that so necessary all the time? You see how radical a statement Jesus makes about that. And we as Christians, we have a Holy Spirit. I'm not arguing you can lose your salvation. I don't believe you can. But I believe we have passages for Christians who have the indwelling Holy Spirit in the Bible, passages like I'm going to read for you, to challenge us, to warn us, to, to move us to, to the stark reality of just how important it is. Because the Bible recalibrates us to the fact that what's really important for God in our life, that we're multi-billionaires, that we have no problems whatsoever. No, he, his goal, his desire is that we be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And when it says he worked all things together for good, that is specifically the good that he's talking about. Amen. He's like, Lord, I wanted to be released from all my problems. He's like, I'm not into that. I just wanted you to make me more like myself. So you can get back to your original purpose, reflecting out the image and likeness of God to the rest of creation. Because that's why I created you. And through that experience joy and blessing that transcends your circumstances bringing praise and glory to the one true and living God the almighty and I'm just I think I was going to remind us this morning it is a scary place church it's a scary place to get to that place in your life where you adamantly resist the change and the growth the Holy Spirit wants to bring to your life I think right now we need to feel a little bit of fear of the Lord right, right now. I like have a little bit of fear of the Lord. What did, what did John, John has been serving the Lord faithful. John is an apostle. Truly he's accepted. What does John do when he sees the Lord in Revelation? Falls at his feet as if dead. This is someone who intimately knows Jesus. Right? We, we need... We can't get so comfortable with Jesus being our buddy, my co-pilot, where we just like forget some of that fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. Like we need that element. Otherwise, we, we have a tendency to coast, to get back into the, the, the status quo of life. And what, there's, there's things in our life that the Holy Spirit wants to deal with and that we adamantly resist, and it's because we're living in a perpetual state of fear that's the mind state when it comes to that area of our life that we're living in and we can quench the spirit and here's here's the scary part for me as a pastor okay and i'm just bringing you into my world a little bit is the idea where someone has done this so much we get to the place where i have to wonder do they have the holy spirit i hate that do you think i want to question people's salvation Now, I, I'm, God has taught me some lessons. I have a lot of grace with people, a lot of patience with people, because why? I spent seven years away from the Lord. So how I dare I say that that person, because I'm not the Holy Spirit, you know, experienced growth and change on my time, right? But it's the idea of calling yourself a Christian but not having any spirit activity in your life. The idea of calling yourself a Christian but not having any spirit activity in your life. I mean, it's easy to put on a show. Do you know that all the fruit of the spirit can be imitated? So the, the test is, you know, for ourselves, I want to have assurance. And I'm, everything I'm saying, I have to direct to myself first. Because I need to be challenged. Like, hey, am I walking in delusion? Are there things that I'm resisting? So let me give you some passages to kind of summarize what I've been talking about. And I'm hoping I'm being clear enough where you can p p pick up what I'm trying to communicate. I'm going to give you some Bible, okay? So if you have an argument, it's not again with me, it's with the Bible, okay? But here are these words. Uh, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, one of the scariest passages in the Bible, okay? For it is impossible... To bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted of the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come, and who then turn away from God 
It's impossible to bring such people back to repentance. By rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. So I, I, I want to take that verse even further this morning because I want to say, you know, yeah, we can, we can use that verse to talk about apostates. Okay, apostasy. That's the idea of I'm a Christian, and then one day I say I'm not a Christian. The word apostasy means to turn back, which is what Jesus was talking about in Luke when he said, put your hand to the plow and turn back. I could summarize that whole thing as, a, as it's talking about apostasy, the idea of turning back. But yeah, we can, we can apply that just to apostates, but I want to challenge myself this morning with that verse, the idea of growth in my life. I've experienced, I've, I'm reading the word of God, the Holy Spirit is communicating with me, and yet I come to a place where whatever he wants to area he wants to grow in my life I resist and I because I'm, I'm not doing it can that can that verse be applied to me like uh, I'm rejecting the son of God I'm holding him up to public shame I've, t- I've tasted the goodness I've seen from the word of God the power of the age to come I've shared in the Holy Spirit but yet I get to a place in my life where it's impossible to renew me to repentance in that area like repentance is such a gift like that I could have an emotional response about my sin versus having a hardened heart about that where that just becomes normal. Are you guys feeling that a little bit? Can we let that verse just like wash over us and challenge us? Like, you know what? I need to be on God's time, not just mine. I need to submit to what he wants to do in my life. He knows better what's best for me more than I do. He loves me. Yes. It's, you know what I mean? it's, it's not because he wants to do evil in my life. He wants to give me a security and a hope yes. that transcends my, my circumstances. Yes. Let me give you another one. Second Peter, it's not just the author of Hebrews that wrote, said this. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20. Again, we want to let, let these verses challenge us, not just say, oh, that's the other guy. Second um, Peter 2, 20 says, And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord. Sounds like someone who just became a Christian, right? Someone who escapes from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sounds like he's describing a Christian, right? Would we agree? And then gets tangled up and enslaved by sin again. They are worse off than before. It would be better if they had never known the way of, to righteousness than to know it and then reject the command they were given to live a holy life. Can I say that part of our call to live a holy life is a call to find the healing that is available in those areas of our pain or our trauma or our hurt or our bondage or whatever it is based on our, your own personal story and my own personal story. Doesn't that seem like it's not just optional for us to do it on our time, but God has a purpose and plan that we need to submit to in our life for healing? Amen. Now, that's not all that it means, but I think that's, that's got to be part of what it means. That's got to be one of the categories it's referring to. But this is something I could never say as a pastor. It, it has to be the Bible that would say something like this, because I don't have the authority to make a statement like this. right? I, it would be better off to have never known the way to righteousness than to know it and reject the command they were given to live a holy life? Better off, really? So, oh. Let me give you another one from Hebrews 10.26. Uh, Hebrews 10.26. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. <sighs> is it a sin? Like James talks about, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And this is where we get the categories in our theology of omission and commission, right? Com- commission, things you, a sin you commit, and omission is things you should have done but you didn't. It's like the Lord is saying, I, I, you need to find healing in me in this area, but we resist. Is that sin? I think that's partly what, what Hebrews 10 is talking about. If we deliberately continue sinning, like resisting what the work that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our life. And again, I'm not just trying to put, you know, 
use guilt and shame or, or, or point the finger at anybody. Again, this, this message I'm giving starts with me challenging myself. Like, I, I don't need to think that I've arrived and I'm no longer susceptible or, or ne- this is no longer necessary for me. Matthew 12, 43, Jesus again, when an evil spirit, Matthew 12, 43, when an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert seeking rest but finding none. Then it says, hmm, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its, its former home empty, swept, and in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they all enter the person and live there. And so that person is, here it is, that same concept again. That person is worse off than before. That will be the experience of this evil generation. And so Jesus is applying that principle to the nation of Israel in, in, here in the, Matthew. But it, it can be true for us. Like we find victory in this area. Like we're getting victory. And then we get that relief. And then we relent and we turn back. And then the end result is that the end could be worse than the, than the beginning. Like, Lord, I need full victory. Like, Lord, don't let me turn back. I want to submit to you. I can't trust my, my, you know, my judgment in every area. I, Lord, there's areas where I need to bend my will to yours. Amen. Because if, Lord, just, I, I, need, I want to take this and turn it into a prayer. Lord, please do what you got to do in my life. Even if it means taking out of your toolbox some of the suffering go ahead and do that because I don't want my worst state like I don't want to be the case of my life where I'm worse off than had I never even encountered even in the state even as a Christian if you need wisdom James 1 5 sorry James 1 5 if you need wisdom ask our generous God he will give it to you he will not rebuke you for asking but when you ask him hear this church When you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. That's like the idea of, like, Lord, I want victory. Like, I submit, but in the back of my mind, I'm still thinking, yeah, I love my sin. I'm not ready for that change. I'm not ready for that growth. So, yeah, Lord, I want it. Uh Uh-uh, not really, kind of. And that soul-mind dichotomy is at work, and in the back of my mind, who's already gotten the victory? The mind has. You know what I mean? And I'm, uh, scary. And it's like, you know, I wonder why I'm not getting victory. Because it's like all lip service, but the Lord sees the heart. And so I, I become unsettled, unstable in all my ways, and I'm not receiving anything from the Lord. And I, I, I really believe that you can live quite a few years, maybe close to a lifetime in this state, telling yourself you're fine and that you're a Christian the whole time. But like the whole plan that God has, has for us, we've set it aside, and we're kind of doing our own Christian thing. We're kind of living the Christian life the way we, on our terms. Is that even an option? Like... It, it kind of doesn't make sense when you think about it, okay? Because I mean, God is like, he's exclusive. Like, you can't be double-minded. You, you can't have two masters. You can't serve two masters. So if you think you can, it, you, just, you can't. But we're pretty good. Our mind's pretty good at convincing ourselves that we can. And so we're like, you know, and we plateau, status quo. But I, I was like, is there a such thing as a plateau? Because I, it seems to me in my understanding now at this age of my life that you're either moving forward or you're moving backward. It's like, Lord, can we just pause here for a moment? Can we just take a rest? You know, that might be an option. Like, Lord, this is pretty intense. Like, whew, can I just catch my breath? Maybe, Lord, give us a, you know, a, and then we're going to pick it back up, Lord. Just, but, man, if you stay there too long, what are, you're starting to, you know, do this. Like, I want to go back to what's familiar. And that's, what, that's why the, uh, the idea of the dog returning to its vomit. That's disgusting. Why does a dog do that? Right? You ever seen a dog do that? That's, that's a thing. And, but we do the same thing. Like we've gotten victory. We, we're getting some victory. We're getting, we're getting some growth. And then we're like, you know what? Let's go back to where we were. And, I, <laughs> and sometimes we can't see it. And that's why we need a community of people that love us, that we're accountable to, where we confess our sins. Like, yeah, I'm struggling. I just want to be on the opening with you on the front end. I really want to go back to where I was before. 
I'm just letting you know, you need to pray for me right now. Can you please pray for me? Because if I go back there, like, it's not going to be good. Right? And the idea of drifting slowly and surely away from the Lord. Now, having said all that, can we go back to Revelation and just, wow, my goodness. And you didn't even start the clock on time. Uh, so, boy, we, we, we got to be done. Um, so remember what I was saying about the linear chronological versus recapitulation? Uh, we're going to save that for Wednesday. Because uh, if I had my way, we'd spend a good half hour just reading passages of Revelation. There's five major sequences I would love to, for you to read. So I want you to come prepared to read some passages of Revelation together as a community group this Wednesday. And then I want you to answer a question. Okay? When you're doing this, I want you, to, as the Bible says, to gird up the loins of your mind. I think you know what that means, right? Uh, don't just allow your mind to wander when we're, when we're reading these passages, okay? I want you to stay engaged, like, with the prayer, like, Lord, fundamentally change my beliefs, change my outlook. Amen. But having said all that, I want to, in closing, I want to come back to Revelation 1-3. God blesses, excuse me, God blesses the one, now I just read that, do you want to know who, what the answer is? Like, we're being promised a blessing, who's it for? Anybody need a blessing from God? Okay, yes, everything we've just been talking about to get growth, victory in our life and whatever those areas are, that's a blessing. Okay, check it out. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. And he blesses all who listen to its message. That's not enough. Don't stop there. And obey what it says for the time is near. The book of Revelation is not just merely telling you what's going to happen in the future. It's a message to, to which we are to submit, so we, we are to obey its message. And as a result, receive its blessing. Now, when it says prophecy, can I, can I tell you something? The word prophecy in the Bible, the, the idea of prophet, the essential thing about a prophet or prophecy is not just telling the future. It's proclaiming the word of God. Okay, so with prophecy, there is a foretelling and a foretelling. Yeah. It's not just, oh, we're always making predictions about the future, okay? Now, I, I, I have said everything I've said this morning to ask you this question. What do you suppose that blessing is? Having said everything we've said this morning, what do you think that blessing promised from Revelation 1-3? I've said everything I've said to to help us get to the place where we can answer and know and understand what that blessing actually is. Got any ideas rolling around? Hope. Hope. The idea of the Holy Spirit illuminates our hearts and minds, our souls, to the meaning, to the message, to the reality contained in the book of Revelation. And as a result, we live in light of that truth. We obey that truth. And as a result, our lives are transformed. As a result, the blessing is we are able to transcend our negative circumstances and live in victory and in joy. Because of the meaning that we assign to those circumstances is different than one that lives without purpose, without hope. And then as a result, we, we have a life of blessing that's not constrained, again, by our circumstances. That's what I think the, the blessing is. So can you see how we need a book like Revelation to change our outlook? And it starts with that sequence. It, the book of Revelation wants to change your beliefs about the world so that you have different thoughts leading to different emotions, leading to different actions, all of which need to be in, in victory and in joy. Here's a verse I'm going to leave you with that helps me reinterpret the meanings of my experiences 
is Revelation 5, 3, 5. I said this multiple times. I want to give it to you again. I'm, I'm going to be done. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life. But I will announce before my Father and His angels that they are mine. I want to live in such a way where no matter what's going on, like I, I'm responding and being a spiritual man that God has called me to be such that I can be looked back at the circumstance and be proud that I brought honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ even in that darkest moment. Amen. I remain faithful. So it's this understanding of ultimate reality that is being communicated to us in the, in the book of Revelation that really allows us to have the patient endurance in the darkest of times. Amen. Because we don't just see what's happening, we see what God wants to do through what's happening. Let him do it, church. Let him have his way. That's, that's what I, I want to say to us this morning. Father, thank you so much. You don't leave us to walk in darkness, like grasping in the darkness, looking for meaning, looking for hope, looking for purpose. Lord, I pray that you would use the book of Revelation in, in the time ahead to, to fundamentally help us recalibrate in some areas of our life where maybe we've been susceptible to, to darkness. Lord, give your people a hope that transcends no matter what the circumstance. That they can walk in that hope because their hope is secure because it's you. Lord, this is not just a, a fantasy. This is not just a relationship with our imaginary friend, Lord. This is ultimate reality that is being, that is like you're, you're breaking out of heaven and stepping down into our world, condescending to us to let us know the truth, the reality of things. Oh, what a joy that this life is not all there is, that the material is not all there is. Lord, help us to live in light of that truth, Lord. Show it to us, Lord. I ask, finally, I ask you to invite your Holy Spirit to do the, the specific work on each of us as individuals, Lord, that you'll do through us, in us, throughout the week. Lord, help your people to un understand that, that this is why we need to read your word. This is why we need to meditate on your word. This is why we need to pray, because our soul needs to be fed so that we win those little uh, dichotomous uh, battles that we have going on, that we get victory in those things on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Lord, when we deny the truth that you give us, Lord, we, we walk through a wilderness, a dry and dusty land in a desert place, Lord, all alone, Lord, and that, what a tragedy that is. Lord, I just pray by the power of your spirit that you would help your people to understand what I'm trying to communicate from your word this morning. And Lord, give them the hope, give them the encouragement to step out. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.